technical side and the journalism side. Um, and we're hoping to pose some questions um, and hopefully get some answers about how the media and NGOs can work more effectively together. Um, so I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves so I uh, don't say anything that they wouldn't be happy with. Um, but we're also hoping for a lot of our audience participation. So I know a lot of you are also experts in your own fields. Uh, so there's going to be a mic circulating around. Uh, Phil has the mic. So if you want to comment on anything that's being said or pose your own questions to the panel, um, get a mic from Phil. And if you don't like speaking on a mic, you can also tweet to at Ruam Collective. And someone's going to be monitoring that feed. So if you want to put a question to the panel, we'll make sure the relevant ones are passed on to the moderator. Uh, yeah, so thanks for coming. And I'll let the panel introduce themselves. My name is Sharon Wilkinson. I've been in development since 1972, over 20 years in Africa, over three in India, and 16 here in Cambodia. Um, I've worked in the health sector, in emergency response, in conflict areas such as Rwanda, um, and I'm delighted to be invited here today to talk about this connection between media and NGOs. Good evening. My name is John Morales. I'm the program manager for the Asia Foundation's Urban Services Program here in Cambodia. I previously worked in the Philippines uh, for working on economic reform in the Philippines, also for the Asia Foundation. And uh, welcome to, to the night. Hello, everybody. My name is Sebastian Strangio. Um, I'm a journalist who's worked in Cambodia since 2008. Uh, I spent three years at the Phnom Penh Post, and since then I've been working on a freelance basis covering, um, covering the region. Um, and I'm also the author of a new book on Cambodia entitled Hun Sen's Cambodia, which is out now at Monument Books, just in time for Christmas. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Naren, Sun Naren. Uh, I'm from Voice of Democracy, which is under the Cambodian Center for Independent Media. I'm working there. Uh, I'm oversee the uh, website vodhotnews.com, and it is in our language. And uh, I hope I can share my experience, uh, the relationship between uh, journalism and media. Us, I'm sorry, journalism and development in Cambodia. Okay, thank you. And uh, hello, I'm Rick Valenzuela, president of the Overseas Press Club of Cambodia, and I'll moderate. Um, yeah, and I'll try to get out of the way and be over this way. Uh, so we're all here, I guess, because we're communications professionals, right? Or more or less, either working on the media side or from the looks of it, a lot of people who are working in, de in the development side. But we're also, even though we're communications professionals, we just don't communicate that well when, we have to, when our trains are going in the same direction. Um, so we'd like to open that up and discuss how to work better. Um, so, if we can start off with Narin, you had actually said, how could organizations create an event um, that would attract media attention? And I don't know if you want to dive into that right away. I'm going to step on that a lot. Oh. I think uh, since VOD is a uh, local uh, media and it is under uh, Cambodian Center for Independent Media, which is an organization. And we always keep our good relationship with the NGO in Cambodia. And we always get news from the civil society in Cambodia. But the question is that we only get news or uh, only the information from active civil society, active NGO in Cambodia. And the news is in interesting like the news really related to human rights issues about forest and we see some only some organization in Cambodia really touch that issues like Cambodian Center for Human Rights which they talk a lot about human rights issues Nikado ad hoc and those organization always set up the event which attract the attention of the media. And then we can compare some events that only do in the same way, but it does not 
attract the attention of the media. For example, if they, they want to do a campaign about to raise awareness about child violence, and if they do just only a workshop, maybe it's not enough to attract the attention of the media. But if they do like a campaign, walking around the street, and then maybe it, it's enough to attract the attention of the, uh, the journalists who work for even local or international. One, one more thing is that uh, because VODs, uh, we, we have been uh, having a good relationship with uh, the uh, civil society, so they always send us the press release which, uh, n about the event that, that they will do some kind of press conference, about uh, about their activities and sometimes you know when they issue the report and also they can send to us and this is also interesting for us to cover but the thing is that we see only some only some NGO really active so that it can draw our attention but only some some they, they are not active it means that they don't have any network with local or international NGO so they cannot share the information and sometimes the event is not attractive at all. They do it in, in, in the way that only just for, for some local media, but not really touch the attention of inter international media or even a media which they produce the content in English. Okay. Do you want to pick it up from there? I think one of the um, issues that Naren's hit on is that development is really slow and complex. Even if we're having an emergency response, it's still a complex situation. Whereas journalists want something that's going to end up on the front pages. It's going to be something of, that's going to grab the attention of a very large audience. And you were telling me the other day, Naren, that the NGO invited you to a workshop. Well, you know, it's not news. NGO has workshop. It's not going to get anyone's attention. But however, if, you, if we as NGOs say, okay, what we're really talking about is that solar disinfection of water works at village level. We've been able to show that the incidence of diarrhea has dropped substantially at village level and that the infant mortality rate has dropped as a result. Now that can be news. And that's the type of way we need to talk about our work, not to say come along to a workshop, but what is that workshop going to be producing? What's that workshop going to be able to tell the, the community in terms of evidence? Yeah, I think um, also to follow on from that, that kind of public, public uh, attention and media attention to a, to a subject is a little bit of a blunt tool um, when it comes from the NGO point of view. So the NGOs are not homogenous, of course, uh, as I think a lot of you would know. Um, the kind of temperament and philosophy and approach of an NGO really determines how the its engagement with media. So there, there's kind of a two-prong problem. One is a lot of the time we don't know how to engage the media. Um, for many of us in our budgets that come from donors, there's no space for a media coordinator, or a communications, um, a communications point person, somebody who can really craft our narrative for us. So it's me, usually sitting in an office, kind of amateur hour, trying to figure out, okay, what what does the media want, and often not not um, not being able to pick it up. Or if I, or even if we do have that, sometimes these issues where you have kind of have a spectrum between advocacy and improving services, there's a different level of engagement that you need. When you're talking about reform and delivery of services, and sort of, if you want to talk about it crudely, reform from within, um, it requires a much deeper engagement with issues than kind of an event-based or event-driven news coverage. And so how, how do NGOs kind of tell that story, which is a lot more nuanced and a lot more arcane in a lot of ways is, is a big question for us. So how do we get that engagement from, from the media? Um, I think I'll start by just making a couple of observations. Um, I think a good starting point is to recognize that when the media and nonprofits interact, both sides have something to gain 
from the equation. Uh, the American journalist David Reif, who worked in crisis zones across the world, including Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, said that the relationship that he saw with the nonprofits and humanitarian organizations he, he engaged with was, uh, the, the relationship was very complicated. And he said it was never quite clear who was exploiting whom. Um, and um, I think in the case of, um, I think this point pinpoints the fact that there actually is a decent amount of common ground between the nonprofit sector and, and the media sector. Um, what I can say from the media perspective is that not all issues are made equal. Um, there is, um, you know, rightly or wrongly, certain issues are seen to be more interesting, more sexy, um, and this, this is especially the case now. The way that the media is developing, the stable medium of print is dying. Um, we're in the we're, we're basically on a sinking ship, a lot of us, and the shift to the internet has created new pressures. Um, uh, everything is me measured now in eyeballs and clickability. And so the, this issue you talk about, about the com complex nature of development work, it's even more difficult for the media to articulate that and be given the space um, in which that, an exploration of that sort of complexity is even possible. Um, so I think that those are a couple of good, you know, sort of, I think it's important to understand that there is potentially quite a lot of common ground, but there's also a tension there as well. Yesterday we were asked to raise some of the concerns we may have working in NGOs, about our concerns with working with the media. And if you'll excuse my piece of paper, don't do this if you are sitting in a high school exam. No, no crib sheets loud, okay? But I need it. So here we go. I, I'd raised four issues in my own mind of my concerns of working with the media. One is the, the, the possibility of misrepresentation or being misquoted. It has happened to me, and I got so badly misquoted, I made private eye. I actually think that was something I'm quite proud of in retrospect, but at the time it was really very sobering. Um, being quoted out of context is a worry for NGOs. There is a salaciousness. Let me pick up on your comment there, um, Sebastian, of it, you know, wanting a sexy story. Uh, the salaciousness that comes about when people are covering the stories of trafficking or uh, Balk gang rape, um, etc., and wanting to know those minute details of women who have been raped. Who, when, how did you feel? Uh, the example I'm going to draw upon is uh, Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, ripped asunder with violence. Uh, women who had had the most terrible things happen to them, who'd seen their fathers, their brothers, their husbands, their sons murdered. And a journalist walks into the NGO space where they're being protected and says, anyone here been raped and speak English? That's the salaciousness that worries NGOs. I have concerns um, from the faith-based organizations across the world where many journalists are not just prepared to accept, I realize, that your faith could be driving your willingness to work in some of the most difficult places in the world. No, if you're Islamic, maybe you're trying to militarize people. And if you're Christian, are you proselytizing? Always looking for a backstory that may not be there. And I do have a concern about that. I have a concern about our political comments. We are constantly involved in a political dialogue. Nothing we talk about isn't political. It's water, it's land rights, it's access to education and health. It's political, small p. When my statements about um, a, a living wage is then juxtaposed with the statements from CNRP saying the same thing and making it sound as if the NGO is really supporting the opposition, I have a problem, I have a real concern, because that puts me into a very difficult position with my MOU with the government, which says no partisan political activities. So I'm, I have those concerns. I just want to, to add something more about that. Uh, for the journalism part, also, sometimes we also have a 
upset with some NGO because you know sometimes they had the event and we send reporter over there and then they come without any story and and some NGO they they want the story and you know sometimes they have a package of money for local journalists and and then in return with the story and that we sometimes we cannot produce because it's not newsworthy and also you know some event which is small but I mean it's not interesting at all but we have government representative maybe minister or a secretary of state and they will do a speech but their speech is really attractive and maybe some reporter they can take it as a news angle for the story and that we report about it and some NGO that they organize the event they they call us and they say why you do you you don't report about my event and you just picture a person speech and then you make as a news and I think uh, that's the question for a journalist they want interesting story to the audience and they try to focus only interesting and goal which is something more related to maybe human rights issue about forest deforestation about political issues so this is also also con con concern concern for us and you know some NGO when they have the event in the in the province and also they invite us and they say okay I, I pay for you everything I pay for accommodation I pay for your, your food and don't worry about it and sometimes they say but make sure you have some story about our event and we always reply back that we don't guarantee a hundred percent that we will produce a story related to your event but we may do some other story which is is in the interest of uh, our audience um, so just responding to Noreen's point uh, there's actually I think it's important for journalists to understand that um, all right sorry um, I think it's important for journalists to understand actually that there are kind of background issues when it comes to, for example, that where there's there's this sense where the NGO is looking for a quid pro quo with a journalist. So I I feed you, I bring you out to the area, and then you write a story. And it's not just an attitude problem actually. It's actually built directly into the structure of how donor money works. And that's because a lot of government donor money is from. Um, this kind of very linear sort of thinking where you have a donor and you spend money and you get audited after three or four years and the donor says what you spent this money for this guy and what what was the output they're always a, a lot of donor organizations are saying what's the output what's the output and you say well I don't know he didn't want to write a story and then you somehow have to have justify to the audit um, you know, so it's it's not always something nefarious, basically. Where it's it's I, I give you money and then you put me in a in a a nice light, and that kind of follows on to the second issue of the donors do read these um, these the English language dailies. A lot of them are coming in from the pro the big program designers are coming in from D.C., from Canberra, from London, and they come in and the first thing they do is read the papers, and that informs their program design. So it's not it's not just a one way street of the journalists will come to to us for information on the issues, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, there's a big influence because what goes down in the printed page actually influences what goes down uh, in the donor programs from these large donors, which is the main source of money for NGOs here. I think, personally speaking, the the most fruitful relationships that I've had as a journalist with NGOs and nonprofits is are relationships that have been developed over a very long time. You know, um, you get to know somebody, you work with them several times, they begin to trust you, you begin to trust them. They're more willing to give you information on, uh, on, deep ba on background or deep background, um, and they trust that you're not gonna, they're not going to see their quotes in the paper the next day under a, a sensationalist headline. Um, and I think this, a lot of the issues that Sharon talks about um, really can be resolved through trust. And I think in the Cambodian context, I mean, that, that goes without saying, I suppose, but in the Cambodian context, we live in Phnom Penh in an incredibly itinerant place. New journalists are arriving every month. Um, the same probably applies on the NGO side, too. New staff are coming in. 
Some stay for three months, some stay for 10 years, but the vast majority of people are here, you know, I would say under two years. And so it makes building a lasting relationship very difficult. Um, and it's, it, it can be a real challenge to establish those relationships and, and keep them going amid the sort of revolving door of staff changes and um, personal changes and so forth. One of the things I was thinking about was, um, Sebastian, you had brought up, you know, how much space a writer may have to actually write about a story. And John, you brought up the quid pro quo that your, your donors and your bosses are, are looking at the papers and reading. And, and I should bring up here, I, I want to comment that we all have bosses, we all have budgets. Um, so obviously a lot of NGOs are looking to get their stories told and a lot of journalists are pressed for time to crank out what they can on deadline to fill that hole or their editors are looking for that. Um, there, is, there has to be a way to package stories from the NGO end to present this to journalists and get it out in a more efficient format. You can manage ex expectations. You can tell if one of your stories is particularly more emotional, maybe contact a visual journalist. If it's data-driven, contact the print journalist. Um, and there are ways to package that. I don't know if you have experience in this realm working with different, different formats of news. Some experience, yes. When I think about the way in which um, one of the questions we talked over the other day was about crisis. Would, would a crisis get more news coverage? And the answer is yes, because one of the statements that come out of journalism is, if it bleeds, it leads. Hence the Ebola stories on every front page. Even though the numbers who have died are nothing like the numbers of children who died of water born diseases every year. So we do have that point about news. It's something that maybe only the public can change. I also know that since I'm in development, at the moment I work on the Australian Award Scholarships, I don't expect tomorrow to see a headline which says 30 years of steady progress. It's not going to be headline news. Earlier I worked with Care International on the Highland Bilingual Education Program. I don't expect to see the headline, 20 years of getting kids into school. It's not happening. Yet a lot of that is really good development work and needs some sort of coverage. You asked about the type of media. I've seen some incredible work that's taken place between media experts and NGOs. And I'll give you two quick examples, if I may. I know I'm using a lot of time. Um, way back when we were in Africa, uh, we worked with Water Sanitation Group. And we were working a lot to try to raise the issues of waterborne diseases, diarrhea, wash your hands, you name it. We printed leaflets, we talked, we were in every village. And I went back to UK, and this organization had a three minute, um, like advertisement on the television. And it was wonderful. It was the middle of the night, a little five year old toddler gets out of her bed, toddles along the corridor to the bathroom, and you're going, oh, she's in her jammies, it's so sweet. She's going into the bathroom by herself, and then she lifts the toilet seat up and drinks from the toilet bowl. And the line was, millions of children across the world, this is the only type of water they get to drink. And it really brought the message home. And then they said, and if you do ABC, this is how we'll change it. And the next message was the NGO work, getting fresh water, drinkable water, into villages. With the HIV AIDS um, epidemic that came sweeping through the world in 84, um, I was lucky enough to be working in health at that time. And we were really stymied at how we can get condom use right across the world. And I saw the most magical media outlet who they, they did a very clever little advert. It went like this. A teacher outside the classroom watching all the young people, uh, adolescents, pouring into the class and a condom dropped. No, it was all wrapped up, don't worry. He picks it up and he storms into the classroom and he says, who owns this? Own up, who does this belong to? Obviously expecting everybody to deny, not me, not me, definitely not me. One after the other, those young people got up and said, it's mine, sir. It's mine, sir. It's mine. And what that did was make it okay for 
teenagers to carry condoms. We can work across this divide. We can make our work have a huge amplifying effect if we work well with media, and particularly today's media, which is visual as well as written. Thank you. I, I also actually have a uh, comment from the audience. Um, I think that NGOs need to learn to craft a story, a narrative that encapsulates what they're trying to do. Well, I mean, I think that's definitely true. And I think that in the media, we are, you know, we consciously seek out narratives and stories that can be used as a way of entering into a very complex issue. Um, I mean, the danger, of course, is that the narrative is the, is, takes an extreme example. Um, in, you know, if you're talking about anti-trafficking, you have um, the recent controversies around Somali Mam and the, the stories that she told that there are serious doubts about the verity of now. Um, and, you know, the sort of, it's a dangerous because the media and, and non-profits both have, in those sorts of cases, an incentive to tell a sexy story. Um, and, you know, media and non-profits, they're scrupulous ones on both sides and there are also less scrupulous ones on both sides and and so a narrative is important but I think there's also it also has to be managed carefully so that that doesn't lead to sensationalizing an issue or or amplifying a certain um, uh, particularly um, horrific element of an issue um. and remember if anybody has a question there's a microphone roving around on the back people can flag Philip I, I also just want to share some of concerns about the NGOs. Uh, you know, we have, uh, according to uh, the statistic, we have uh, around uh, 4,000 international and local NGOs in Cambodia. And you see some, how, how many NGOs are really active? Local NGOs, we see only a small number of local NGOs are active in terms of they produce uh, Maybe uh, they got fun and then uh, they do some uh, campaign about human rights issue, about forest, something like that. And you know, some NGO, which is local NGOs, and they, they sometimes don't, ha don't have their media expert, like communication officer to talk to journalists. And sometimes they organize the event and they don't have the media expert, which they have experience in journalism and then they go to a uh, communication field and they can do a very good campaign to attract the journalists. They can write a very good press release, which is, can be both in our lang in Khmer language and also in English. And sometimes they don't know how to organize the event well. So it can also bring the gap between journalism, I mean, between journalists and civil society, how they can attract uh, the attention of uh, the journalists because they don't have media experts which can produce a very good content. Um, well, I, th I think another related issue um, with some of the local NGOs that may not have this capacity is that, um, you know, if we're talking about, say, trafficking, I know that a lot of international anti-trafficking organizations like. have protection policies in place um, that are specifically designed to protect um, some of the survivors um, against being named, against and any of the ramifications that might come from that. But in some of the local organizations, that capacity may not exist. And in these cases, it's a question we should discuss. Who has the responsibility to ensure that you know, uh, the story doesn't have a, a negative impact on anyone that that um, is involved with it. Is it the media's responsibility if that capacity is absent um, at the NGO level, or, or is it up to the NGOs to, to, um, to develop that capacity themselves? Doesn't that go back to media, sorry, media um, ethics? What we should be able to expect from NGOs and from the media is truthfulness, accuracy, objectivity, integrity, fairness, uh, public accountability, and you know that catch-all, do no harm. And I really believe that we should all be able to hold our 
feet to the fire on those ethics. And I want to read a comment from John. Uh, NGOs are in need of communication. Journalists are in need of journalism, not the same. I don't know if anyone may, wants to make a comment. Yeah, I think this goes back to, um, I mean, they are not the same. They're very much not the same. Um, I think this goes back to the issue of uh, we're all kind of making political statements in one fashion or other, especially um, I think in this, in this context, you know, even the slightest bits of information are treated by the government as highly politicized. Um, to give you an example, we did a survey here uh, on solid waste generation, and to do that, you need kind of accurate population numbers. Now, we know that the population numbers in, in Cambodia are a little difficult to come by generally, but there is an official number somewhere. But to get that number is actually, even that basic number, no breakdowns, no demographics, you'd think that it's the most unpolitical piece of information possible, and it's actually guarded very closely. Um, and it's not available publicly anywhere, just the population for Phnom Penh, the official population count. So you've got numbers, you've got Hun Sen saying uh, 3 million population in Phnom Penh, I think a month and a half ago. The website of the city hall says 1.5 million, other people say two, it's all over the place. And it's very difficult to make choices here about, I mean, it makes, uh, it makes huge differences in those, those numbers and then, how do you craft that into kind of a message? Because NGOs are always, have some sort of message in place while the journalists at least try to maintain some objectivity. There's, I think, right? That's the kind of the journalistic ethic is this, this lack of bias, this seeming, well, it's a bit of a, a myth, isn't it? But we all chase an ideal. Yeah, I think it's particularly difficult in Cambodia because we're working in a context in which the government does not really admit the idea that a neutral or independent sphere of politics or society exists. Um, those of us who publish in English um, in Cambodia or on Cambodia are seen as essentially pro-opposition. That's always been the case. The government will not accept any media um, as legitimate that is not harmonized with its political consensus. Um, and so we're already, we're already viewed as, as opposition, and I can see the difficulty for NGOs quoting, um, giving quotes to a journalist, and like you say, attaching yourself to a, an issue which is becoming politicized by the opposition. It must be very hard to maintain that neutrality, well, the sort of neutrality I think is vital for the work that NGOs do. Um, like, maybe if we talk about like some some NGO, if uh, they try to make their events really attract the attention of journalists, and then maybe the government of the government will consider them as the opposition NGO. You know, recently we have a uh, uh, we just get get out from uh, the political deadlock, and before that we see the uh, the I mean many events from the local NGO, like the NGO they working on election, conference and Netflix, they always do uh, something about that and they always issue the statement and saying something about the two parties should work, I mean, uh, try to find the uh, joint solution uh, to, to end political deadlock. And those NGO government officials always consider them as the uh, the um, I mean opposition opposition NGO and at the same time that the media try to go to cover the event and already report about that and the government consider those media as the opposition media and they they always say oh you are in, not independent you don't uh, you you work for opposition media uh, opposition party you provide a lot of space for for opposition party to, to say something against the government, or you report only, only bad story about the government. So it, to look from the perspective from the government official or the government's perspective, maybe 
we try to, to be independent, we try to give fair story, we try to, to touch uh, the story really newsworthy, but the government always say, okay, you, you, are against, uh, you are against the government. And I think we have a question or comment from the back. Maybe I can just ask the question, it's fine. Um, so we're talking a lot about um, politics and the political sphere, um, but I was wondering if um, the journalists here have any kind of training or, or awareness about um, effects of trauma um, uh, in retelling stories of survivors of abuse. Um, yeah, I guess that's my question. Well, um, I mean, this is a problem. I mean, personally, I've never received training um, in that. I don't believe that many journalists have. I think it's, um, uh, and, I, and I think there are, are problems when issues like um, uh, anti-trafficking are, are reported on. Um, and I, I think that's something that, you know, journalists should probably be aware of. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has anything else to add on that. Um, but it certainly seems like a gap. Um, and I know, I know that in, you know, I have friends that work in anti-trafficking organizations and they express very similar sentiments about, especially journalists that parachute into Cambodia, they have three days here, um, they want to get the, the sexiest story they possibly can. And I think it's a bit different amongst us that are based here, but, um, but yeah, that's certainly a problem. I had a comment from, from Aaron about whether journalists would use consent forms or waivers, um, which is something that possibly would come down from the NGO side also, is that that would be mandatory for them to protect the people that they're working with, whereas I know this is not common on the journalist end of things. Um, I, don't care, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that or their experiences with that, if that's actually a hurdle. I think um, uh, w what we are worried about is also when we're working with children and we always need, I think con consent form is really crucial for, crucial for that. Uh, I experienced working on a story about the child labor. It's about the uh, factories in San Luis. They hire a lot of child under the age of, like maybe they are, some a, a thousands of workers, or, or, uh, they are the age, at the age of 13 or 14 or 15 years old. And by law, it is under, uh, I mean, uh, they, they still child, and uh, if a factory is want to hire them, there should be some specific condition for them. And at that time, uh, it's, it's hard for us to, to try to, to get in touch with, with the workers. And, I think con consent form is, is, is that we, uh, I experience myself, is uh, we try to approach their parents and to get their permit to ask any question or to get, make sure that she understands and let the child talk to us. And that is the way that journalists have to stick to in order to make sure that uh, what they told us is from, I mean, is from themselves. Because they still underage, and uh, their parent is the one who take all responsibility, and and we did that. Yeah. Sorry. Hello. Okay. Hi. All right. So I have a quick question. Um, this goes back to what Sharon was saying about a lack of a misrepresentation uh, from the NGO side. And then, Sebastian, what you were saying about a lack of trust. I think what's difficult there is, so from our side, from NGO here, um, we have a media code of conduct that we ask journalists to sign. And within there, one of the clauses is that we want to read the story before it's published. However, nobody, no journalists ever say yes to that. Um, and we're wondering, why is that? Because if there's going to be trust between both of us, we, we don't want to be misrepresented, right? And we want to trust what you're going to say, so let us read it so that we can say, yes, this is exactly what we had said. Please publish it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, this is something that actually um, I've um, faced a lot. You, you do an interview with somebody and they say, can you send me the quotes? Um, and as journalists, we generally, that, it's not something we like to do. Um, not, uh, because often when you do that, people will change things they've said. They'll delete comments that they decide that on, re on reflection they probably shouldn't have said. And um, the sort of rules that we operate by, whereby something is on record, and anything that's on record is you can't take back, um, is, it, you know, you often get people editing their, their, uh, their quotes. Because, you know, it's a couple of times I've accepted and gone, okay, sure, and then kind of had problems because I had quotes that were particularly interesting that I all of a sudden found, saw had been whited out. Um, and so it can be a bit of a sensitive issue. And I think, I mean, the issue of trust is paramount. I think one of the, I mean, as a journalist, the best sources you have are the people that you meet for drinks, uh, meet for coffee, talk about all sorts of issues um, outside of the work relationship um, or, or in the context of work but not in the context of a specific story necessarily. And um, again, in Cambodia, you have this huge turnover. A lot of journalists are, um, you know, we're at the start of our careers when we come here, a lot of us. And so we're learning these sorts of rules and um, learning how to negotiate them kind of on the fly. And so there's, you, so, you know, sometimes we're learning on the job. Um, uh, and I think it's the same thing on the NGO side. Um, so I, I, I think that that one, when you have that um, relationship of trust, you're able to send somebody some comments, possibly, without having to worry that, you know, that th there's, a, there's a sort of understanding that you can check over them for a factual inaccuracy, but you're not going to touch anything else. Um, but that's, you know, it takes a long time to build. Uh, if I could add to that, I think my answer would probably be that if, uh, if you had learned that any journalist had done that for, say, a defense ministry or Ministry of Interior, you would trust them less. That's why we don't do it. Yeah. Like, so it's an across-the-board kind of deal. Right? Uh, you got a mic coming to you. <laughs> Hello, I, I'm a journalist, I don't work for an NGO, but I will say this, that you know, I've been asked repeatedly to, um, to, you know, to play back the quotes to people, and you know, quite often some people are quite shocked by what they've said when they see it in print, and sometimes you get very comfortable with someone on the phone and they might forget that they're speaking to a journalist, and you know, at the end of the day our independence is very, very important, particularly in Cambodia when we're consistently being accused of, you know, working for the opposition or, or being aligned particularly with certain NGOs and our independence is incredibly important to us. You yeah, know? And if we, if we start getting very cozy like that and, and, and sending stories out before they go to print, then, then we, unfortunately, that, that is undermined. Yeah, the independence thing is key. And it, it seems that certain groups will, certain groups will assume that you're on their side by default in a way. Um, and sometimes it's not always the case. You know? um, sometimes we overlap to a significant extent in, uh, we have our ideal of seeking truth and working out what's really going on and exposing it. Um, and a nonprofit might have a different ideal, which is um, complementary but not identical. And uh, hold on, I think we got two comments up here, and I know that we got some questions coming in from the audience. I, I understand that people might want to change their comments, I really do. On the, and I also understand that journalists need to keep their independence. So, Maybe the conversation needs to be around the protection of sources, too. Just like a doctor-patient relationship is somehow privileged, so is a lawyer-client. Um, we're also hearing globally about how the journalist and their sources relationship should equally be protected. And when it's not, you've got this whole whistleblower story and people who become hounded because somebody said who they were, that were the source, etc. How do we deal with that? Yes, we're telling a story. We're getting it over a cup of coffee. I don't even know I'm being quoted over that cup of coffee or that second drink of the night. And then suddenly, you're, next morning, you're in the papers. I mean, can we not have the source of that in some way protected? No, we cannot. Can you tell me why not? answerable to you or any other NGO. You're just a part of the story. I'm sorry. Get used to it. 
It goes in print. That's the way it is. That's the way it works. Uh, it's, it's called independence, and independence in this country is an enormous issue, whether it's in the judiciary or in the NGOs. Yes. Luke, give her, the, give her the mic. I'm sorry. I think there's also, you know, any good seasoned journalist will, will be very, very clear when something is on and off the record. I've had many conversations with people over the phone, and I'm tapping away, and as soon as they say it's off the record, you know, you... you but again, it's like what Sebastian was saying, you know, we, we build up relationships with people and we build up that trust. But that's, you know, off and on is a big part of it. And if something's off the record, it's off the record. Yeah, this is sort of our you know, um, code of ethical conduct. Yeah. Um, and it is the basis of the moral um, authority that the press is able to claim is that we do have very strict rules. Um, you know, and look, the difficulty with this is that you get one journalist who breaks that code of ethics and it can that story that story from a nonprofit that's misquoted or a politician who's misquoted will cascade down um, i know that in the, the australian government i'm from australia they are getting quotes out of the australian government is like getting blood out of a stone and they have an institutional suspicion of the media um, uh, and i can't say whether that's because there's been uh, people have been misquoted but i think that that um, all it takes is one, and unfortunately, um, it can sort of make things difficult for everybody. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I've never worked for an organization that asked, asked for a code of conduct um, from a journalist. I mean, I've never worked for a, an organization that asked for a code of conduct or prior review. I mean, just assuming, I think, well, the organizations I've worked for just assume that you're not going to get it. And honestly, uh, going back to what Sebastian said about you have to build that relationship of trust because that's where the kind of juicy things fall out. A code of conduct, if you think about what a contract is, it's kind of how you bridge the gap with a piece of paper in trust. How do you bridge the gap in trust with a piece of paper anyway? So if you have to have that, if you're at the point where you have to have that, then you probably shouldn't trust them, right? If you're, from my point of view as an NGO and my personal experience, if I have to give you a piece of paper that guarantees that you're not going to screw me, then I don't trust you, and so why would I tell you anything, right? Um, and this goes back to, I mean, really at the core of this is that um, for, that's kind of one of the gaps, right, between journalism and NGOs. How do you bridge that gap of trust where you also, each side is also maintaining their independence? I think that's the core uh, problem here that we're trying to discuss um, in general. Uh, can we, you know, can we have beers and can we talk it over and then still say, well, I'm not biased towards your point of view, well, from the journalist side? Can I just uh, make a comment to what you just said? I just wanted to say that um, just because you sign a contract doesn't mean, I mean, like you shouldn't trust them because of that. I think that's a way to make people accountable to what they um, agree to. So I don't think it's necessarily um, that you shouldn't trust them. I mean, I'm talking like when if you think about I don't want to get too pedantic here, but if you think about what a contract is in a world of perfect trust and perfect honesty, contracts are not needed. That's why everyone kind of slags on lawyers, right? Because they're uh, right. Um, because they're kind of a, a symptom of a necessary evil. In a world of perfect trust where we can all perfectly trust each other, you don't need a piece of paper to guarantee and hold somebody accountable because they are your friend, they are your relationship in some way. You have some other means of holding them accountable. So in my mind, I'm not going to give somebody um, a juicy piece of information that could come back and bite me if I think that I have to trust them because the force of the law, a third party is going to come in and punish them. I mean, that's just my, that's my personal philosophy. Um, that, I mean, that's, that's not a relation of, relationship of trust to me. Yeah, I've never um, been presented with uh, a contract like that, and I probably wouldn't sign it either. I mean, it seems like it would be, like, I think this is, the sense that you're being judged guilty without, like, uh, presumed guilty is sort of um, what I think is of a concern for us. Closer, I met. And we got two questions in the back, or, Naren, do you need I, my, my experience is also uh, like, uh, especially is something related to trust. When you trust between the source and you are a journalist, and, and as a journalist, when you work professionally and ethically, I think you, you are aware of 
aware of what should be on the record and what should be off the record. And we understand that. And when we meet our source and, okay, I, I tell you this, and I have something more, but if you want to know, it should be off the record. It means you, you cannot quote me this. And if you do like that, I won't tell you anymore. And I experienced this. Uh, and even some organization and some journalists, they come to me and tell me, now that, that guy stopped talking to me and seen one story published and then they, they stopped talking to us. And this is, this is something that we, we should, uh, s some source that the, when they, they know what, what is journalism and they understand how the journalist work is. And, but people in the countryside or the children, when you go to, to interview them, or they don't understand what is journalism. They don't know what, what should be in the article when they speak something. And you know, when they talk to us and when their boss read the story and then they get sacked from the work and that, uh, that is what, what, what should be the, uh, the relationship between the journalist and uh, the source, you know, you write a story and then the story comes out and then you get uh, a set from their boss and, and no job to do and that is what the journalist responsibility also, yeah. But that is a story. Uh, I know we got two questions coming in the back, but I wanted to make a comment here or a question from um, Colin Mine and Ben Woods over at the Cambodia Daily. Work of international development agencies is paid for by the public, so why are those organizations averse to speaking to media, which informs the public? This is a sort of an action and consequences, possibly, from what we're talking about. Mostly, we're, no, we're, not, <laughs> we're not averse to talking to the media. Uh, usually, you can get a quote out of the international NGOs on an issue that they feel they have information about, um, and part of the role of NGOs is to, is to provide accurate information, to be the amplifier of the voice of the people you're working with and for. So it, it's not our role to say we can't talk. There are some cases, however, where our donors say, we don't want you to make a comment, refer them to us, and you're right about... That's one of the main problems. I think that's probably one of the main problems here that a lot of people run into, is that it gets comments get pushed up the chain, and then comments are pushed back until after deadline. Yeah. Um, and what you get is so bland, yeah. and so the language is so sort of Orwellian and, and devoid of meaning that it's virtually useless um, for the purposes of any, any s interesting story. But that, that's your story. Okay. So, I mean, um, I've actually been quoted a couple of times in the papers here, and I was specifically going for bland, um, to be quite honest. Um, if it doesn't, I mean, you have, the journalists have one purpose, right? You, I'm, I'm not saying they all have one purpose, but the journalist speaking to me has a purpose that does not necessarily align with mine. Just because it's public, public taxpayer money or whatever, it's been entrusted to us to kind of um, do what we think is best, to use our judgment in pursuing the objective, which is kind of implied or assumed to be a good objective. Hopefully you are pursuing an objective that improves social welfare, improves the lives of people. But it's an intensely political game we're playing in a lot of, in a lot of situations. And we can't always control the message. And that's, that's very important in, um, in, these, in these development projects. So if it doesn't, sorry? We can't, right? Yeah. So we can't control. We, we can't control the rest of the article. Of course, we don't. We don't try to. Um, but the overall message that we're sending as an organization is escaping our control once we talk to a media. So if if we don't know where it's going, of course we're going to be anxious about how it's going to be used. I mean, I think that's perfectly natural. We're not in a. I I read a quote once, kind of. Um, from the top spy, the top North Vietnamese spy uh, in the Vietnam War. He used to work for Time. And he said that the issue of being a journalist and being a spy are not all that different. It's just what you do with the information. It's a spectrum that you move along. 
what do you do with the information? Do you either keep it secret or do you open it up? And I think for NGOs, we're kind of somewhere in the middle. I mean, we are looking for the truth as well, but how we use that information and how we deploy it is not always, we don't always think that it has to be public information all the time. Yeah, the media, we work on the assumption that in the vast majority of cases, transparency and openness is the right path. Um, and so there's certainly the sense of an adversarial relationship there in some ways. Um, I suppose when I was talking before about the tensions that exist between the two, it's really that, that an interview is an adversarial encounter, uh, or it can be, um, where somebody's trying to obtain information and the other person is being very careful about what they let out. Mike, Mike. Well, speaking uh, of I adversarial relationships, I have a, can I ask a question really quick? Um, I'm wondering if both sides would mind providing some perspective on the recent closure of the Samuel Imam Foundation. We're talking about the intersection of NGOs and journalism. This was an organization that was providing um, livelihood support to rural population shelters. Um, at the same time, its figurehead was lying to both donors and the mass media. What do you think a more responsible relationship would have looked like? And then how do you balance the relationship between needing um, sexy stories, donor funding, and actually getting something done? Uh, I think that, you know, the SMF case is interesting. I think it represents really the um, unscrupulous side of both the press and the, or the sensationalist side of the press with the um, publicity-seeking side of the nonprofit. But basically the, 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 the worst side of both coming together and creating a series of narratives that were well, in, in the case of her own story, false, but then um, that story was picked up by the media and, and broadcast and championed for so many years because it was so sensational and almost unbelievable. Um, and a more constructive, well, it's difficult. You know, in, in the case of Cambodia, you have, a, at least in the 1990s when Somali's story really um, gained traction, you had a country that was recently opened up to aid and international development a huge number of NGOs were here. It was almost like a marketplace of aid. Uh, and in that marketplace for, for international attention, what you get is people competing and a sort of an arms race um, for, uh, for the attention and the, and the, and the funding dollars, um, which in this particular case, I won't say that it's the majority of cases because that, would, that wouldn't be accurate, I don't think, but in this particular case led to what appears to have been a large-scale falsehood um, and fabrication. So, um, as for a more, um, do you guys have any comments about a more constructive way that that um, relationship might have played out? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know the the details of her the kind of funding situation. I think it was mostly private donors, but I'm not. I'm just assuming that from the articles I've read. Um, but I, I think the danger of that lurks once you build that strong narrative, um, which they did. And it was, it looks like it was mostly false. Um, once you build that strong narrative, it creates, it kind of takes on a life of its own and it hijacks your, you know, whatever you do, you become chained to it because you need to keep producing it to keep the money flowing in, to keep the lights turned on, to keep the salary, the salaries paid. And it can really morph into its own monster. And this, this pressure exists throughout the entire structure of development. Um, that one is especially kind of, it was really um, not notable, but you see the same you see the same issue through a lot of less sexy development projects, a lot of boring ones. You, if you read, uh, if you took the look at the results um, in Africa, for example, a trillion dollars in aid spent, and all of these successful projects, and at the end of the day, where are the results? Um, so there's that always pressure to say, well, we're successful, we're successful, so that you can keep. You can keep the, you can keep the project going, and it's not. It's just I think in that human nature. I mean, you believe most of them, most of the people working in these NGOs believe in what they're doing, really believe they're doing good. So you want to keep it going, and you kind of you can fall into that trap as, as they clearly did. In some cases, also it's just cynical, uh, just a cynical play. But who knows? Yeah, the, the difficulty. Uh, the point I was going to make. You asked how. Um, a more constructive relationship might work. I think the difficulty of Cambodia at that period was that um, the, it, it, it sort of, it almost incentivized that behavior on both sides. And um, I'm, it's, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I mean, um, 
the obvious answer would be don't lie and don't sensationalize, but. I, I mean, it, it would take, I think, actually, to wipe things like that out. Um, it would take an enormous kind of international systematic reform of how the entire foreign aid industry works. Um, you know, the incentives that, the individual incentives at every level, you know, how to keep your boss happy, how to meet your targets, et cetera, et cetera, drive, I mean, they all come down to a pressure point down there at the uh, implementation level. Um, and there's an entire weight of an entire international system that is pushing you to say, hey, we're successful, hey, we're successful, and spin whatever story you want. And it comes down to kind of personal integrity, uh, but also the, the system kind of, pushes you towards that as well. If, if you look at the, uh, the Facebook of Mom Somali and also a letter, a letter from her daughter and they say really something bad about like the, I mean the writer of uh, the article and they feel like heard of uh, the article is really hurting a lot of uh, children that are Somali uh, uh, in, in the center and the question is that like is it a journalist fault or or is it because the story the, the generally always want the story really interesting want a story that that most attract the attention of the reader but when the story comes out and then a lot of children in that they face uh, uh, in the center and I, I'm not sure about for local journalists uh, where they dare to write a story about that and cause hundreds of children in Cambodia face difficulty. But maybe for, uh, international journalists, they, they do the story, yeah. Uh, we got a question back here. I think we're also going to try to wind things down a little bit or at least start, start to tie things up. We're a little bit over the hour mark. Hello? I think one topic that we haven't really touched upon is in the end, like as a media like outlet, like let's say as a journalist, you report to a wider audience, but if you're an NGO, you report for different reasons. So for example, you report to donors, you report for general awareness, you report you to your beneficiaries, or you report just to get like keep funding coming in. So I think it's a really difficult relationship that can be formed. It's like how do I use local media, international media, regional media to get my topic out at the same time to like stay true to like truthful facts. So I think that's like, it's not all that simple. You know what I mean? Uh, I think, well, I think you're, uh, I, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't quite quite hear your comment, but I think you're asking the um, the journalism side how to kind of um, mo keep your different audiences as an NGO, is that? The journalist gets in touch with the NGO, then you always have to kind of question the ulterior motive of the NGO for giving information, so like do you give information, like do you do advertisement with a video like what you mentioned before? Or do you want to report on like land grabbing that's going on at the moment? So there's, there's such a like multifaceted layers of information giving and why. So I think it's a bit of a complex relationship, really. Definitely. It does seem that um, in the development sector, it obviously differs between organizations, but there are many more institutional uh, considerations that need to be made about what this publicity, what effect that publicity will have on the cause, on the potential, on the, on, on the, the, the on donors, on, um, on pri and private charities also have to uh, consider that. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, I don't have much more to add really, but it, it's, I mean, that's certainly the, the reason that a lot of, you contact the ADB for a quote about some, um, you know, land grabbing connected to an ADB project and obviously they don't respond because they don't, you know, um, it's for, for these institutional reasons that, um, that lean in the direction of withholding information. And in other cases, the institutional bias might be towards um, uh, being open and, and providing information. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's actually really healthy for a journalist to keep that in mind. Um, we do have an agenda. Um, and those agendas do differ kind of depending on the, you know, depending on a lot of external content, uh, external factors. And when you're speaking to um, somebody from the development side, whether, and, uh, you know, the development industry is not homogenous. Um, so depending on kind of what kind of entity you're speaking to, that changes things. And they do have an agenda depending on what they need from the information sharing. And they're, it is going to be kind of this tug of war um, over the information. And the, the journalist is going to try to crack you open and you're going to try to kind of guide it towards the story you want told. And I think that's completely natural. And as, as long as it's on the table um, and it's open that that's kind of the game that's being played, then I don't see a problem with that at all. Both sides need to understand the rules of the game. And, and sometimes, again, it comes with experience on both sides. And in particular cases, the relationships that individuals have. Because then you, you are both very aware of where you stand. Um, you trust the other person. And um, that's where we both get, um, it seems like, the best results. And we have a question from the back. Yeah. Do you think that when international NGOs sign MOUs with the government that include guarantees not to be involved in partisan politics, despite the fact that you acknowledge that these issues are inherently political and also agreements that, basically non-disclosure agreements, that, that they won't leak information to the press, that they can inadvertently um, find themselves suppressing fairly serious information of, say, abuses or large-scale corruption and not be able to get themselves out of that pickle? That's a great question. I, I think a lot of NGOs, NGOs are worried about their MOUs with the government. And I've talked to a lot of people over the years who say they're, they're fearful of giving their space, for instance, to um, civil society to hold meetings because they're worried if they're going to be closed down. This includes churches, it includes NGOs, and wherever there might be sufficient space for civil society to raise their voice. So yes, it is a genuine concern. Is it enough for them to be quiet about civil uh, rights abuses? No. As you know, many of the NGOs are vocal when it comes to the civil rights abuses. And they're there as long as they've got evidence and information that can be publicly shown, they will be there speaking. Um, I think absolutely that is a danger that you have to keep in mind when you are working with the government in this setting. Um, and that really, it, it really kind of comes down to the personal integrity of the people working in the, in the program. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I'd like to kind of turn it around, but I don't know um, how true this is here. But in any, in any setting, um, for example, when journalists have access, some deep access to a deep source and you come upon something and it, that's the only source, do you burn that source because it's so important or do you kind of keep it open because you think, well, down the line I can get something else? That's always the kind of ethical fine balance that you're trying to make as you're moving through, moving through your career, moving through your work, right? Um, is this the one that, that is just beyond the pale, that I, it's crossed the line and I, can't, I cannot abide by this? And that's... That's kind of a personal question for a, any journalist or for any development worker. Well, I think this debate in the aid world goes back, you know, um, more than 100 years. You know, the International Committee for the Red Cross was founded on the ideal of neutrality, and they, would, they didn't even speak out about um, the murder of the Jews in Europe during the Second World War. And, and that was a case that they got a lot of uh, flack for. But then you start to see groups that decide that they need to speak out. And I think that, that you would agree that that division, that philosophical division um, still exists in the, in the aid and humanitarian worlds today? Uh, we have one question that came in from online. Um, we've heard about sexy topics slash bland NGO stories. Is there a realistic space for journalism and NGOs to move from poverty and pornography? Um, well, I would hope so. Um, I think if you look generally across, generally across the world, there's a lot of um, very good reporting still being done in long form 
um, or even in just dailies around the world. Um, but it's really hard to get readership of that. I mean, it, it takes a lot of you know, personal investment and it doesn't get shared that widely. And it's kind of a sacrifice on everybody's part, the reader's part and the, the publication's part of saying, all right, we're going to try to take you into this really kind of arcane, that not, not easily accessible subject and we're going to try to show you why it matters. Um, and I think that takes a lot of talent and a lot of faith kind of in the reader and in the public in the writer yeah I mean I think the internet I, I think that's actually it's, it's, it's actually been a pretty negative development for the media just in so far as you know attention spans are now being measured in um, hundreds of words rather than in thousands and it really it really is disappointing when you have to file a complex describe a complex social issue in 500 words and make it nuanced um, it's incredibly difficult even impossible in a lot of cases um, but there are publications that do allow really high quality long form journalism, as you say. And I think in those sorts of situations, the two sides can really work together the most constructively. And I think with that, we're going to wind things up. Um, we've got, we're getting rained out, more or less. Um, but we're all going to be here. And uh, if you didn't get your drink yet, uh, get in there and then we can, can talk to anybody here. Networking event starts. <laughs> okay, just to close up, um, on behalf of Ruam, um, I'd like to thank all of our kind panelists, some of whom who may be getting wet here as well. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. thank you, John. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Nguyen. I think that um, the fact that we've gone on a little bit longer than expected really is testament to the quality of the b debates we've had tonight. And if you want to continue talking about this issue, um, look on Twitter at Room Development Collective, Room Collective, sorry, and we can uh, maybe do another event like this in the future. So I'd just like to, um, if Nick, you could uh, bring us a small token of thanks uh, to our panel. Okay. So thank you, Sharon, to just accept that on behalf of the, the whole panel. Um, yes, as Rick just said, we're kind of rained out. Um, I don't think any of us are going too far, but drinks are available behind the bar. And uh, I invite everyone to get to know each other. Thank you so much to everyone who's come along. Off it's now. been a great evening, I think. And uh, we hope that you can start bridging the gap between yourselves, between those of us who are in the media, those, are, those of us who are in development, and let's have a, an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much, everybody.